Hi, Dr. Johnson. Good afternoon. I'm Isha, a high school student who's interested in being a veterinarian. I'm excited to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Kalina Johnson, a board-certified laboratory animal medicine veterinarian and senior director at Merck Research Laboratories in the Department of Non-Clinical Drug Safety and Laboratory Animal Sciences. She completed her bachelor's degree in DVM from Tuskegee University and a master's of laboratory animal medicine and a residency program from the Pennsylvania State University Hershey Medical Center. Dr. Johnson joined Merck in 1997 as a research veterinarian and was responsible for the clinical care, colony health, and animal model development of research animals. Since then, she has taken on roles of increasing responsibility, leading the experimental surgery group at both the New Jersey and Pennsylvania sites, managing a vivarium, developing animal models for all therapeutic areas of interest to Merck, and serving as the lead for imaging projects. She's committed to mentoring, developing people and STEM initiatives. In her free time, she enjoys spending time with her family, reading, swimming, doing yoga, meditating, and cooking. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Johnson to the interview series on the careers of veterinarians. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for asking me. So first, could you tell us about your work? Feel free to share any pictures and slides that you want. Sure. I am, as you stated, I'm a laboratory animal veterinarian. And as a laboratory animal veterinarian, we play many roles and wear many hats. Some of the things that we do are consultations, review of IACUC protocols, model development, clinical care, surgery, anesthesia support, as well as consultation, analgesia support, as well as consultation, research of our own, facility management, and there's so many, many more things that we do. I wanted to give you a little example of what a day in the life would look like. And one of the things that we do a lot of is consultation. And when we do consultation, what we do is we meet with the investigator to talk about what it is they're interested in doing, whether it's developing an animal model, whether it's testing a compound, whether it's wondering what's the best model to use for the procedure or the disease that they're searching or looking for. So a lot of time is spent just having conversation and understanding what the needs are of the investigator, as well as what we can do and how we can collaborate together because collaboration is a major part of the job. So being able to communicate, being able to transfer scientific information into layman's terms so that um, you make sure that you understand exactly what the researcher is saying are extremely important tools to have um, in understanding how to move forward with programs, projects, and making sure that everyone's on the same page and that uh, you're getting the work done that needs to get done. So model development. So animal model development is, um, is exciting, it's invigorating, it is um, scientifically just interesting in its own account because of the fact you're, you're looking at a model, looking for a model that would best suit the need of the experimental design, the program development, and looking for a, either a um, end result as in a cure quote unquote, a model that actually shows you what a disease process looks like from beginning to end, or you're looking at certain phases of the disease process that the model can fulfill so that you're able to better understand the pathogenesis of the disease, as well as where there may be um, areas for improvement, if not curing of that particular problem, disease process, um, things like that. So again, you know, some of the examples would be if we look at cardiovascular disease, uh, it's really one in three deaths are a cause of cardiovascular disease. So in all these years that humans have been on this earth, we've not been able to cure cardiovascular disease. We've had different phases where we've been able to slow the progression of the disease, but never able to cure it. And part of the consultation that we do in the animal model development is looking at what disease phase or what process of the disease you're looking at, as well as what animal model is best suited for that particular phase of the disease, or is there an in vivo process that's best suited for that phase of disease um, instead of using animals? Right? So if you look at atherosclerosis, there are numerous models that are available for atherosclerosis from a zebrafish to a non-human primate. And depending on 
what process of the disease you're in, what specifically you're looking at, what your facility looks like, you can choose any one of these models to use for a model of that disease. And when you're using this as a model, you know, you look at the, the animal model itself, the size of the heart, what exactly you're looking at, are you manipulating it? what blood parameters you're looking at. Do you have a, a analyzer to, to analyze the specific blood products you're looking at? Um, do you have a target that you're looking at? If you do, is that target similar in that animal model as well as in humans? Because if it's not, then that wouldn't be the right animal model to use because you're not able to target the disease that you're looking for. So there are many factors that are involved in choosing an animal model um, as well as you know, it, the consultation again with the, with the investigator so that the two of you are working closely together to determine what works best for the best outcome for the program or project that is being um, evaluated. And two, I wanna say, you know, part of my job also is to make sure that we're not unnecessarily using animals in the drug development process. So we again, look to see if there are in vitro methods that are able to um, replace or refine the process that maybe animals have been used for before. And 90, about 95, 96% of the animals used in research are rats and mice. So there are transgenic mice, they're genetically modified animals that can be used, that can be uh, what we call humanized, given human, human like proteins, um, genes that make them have human cells. So in doing that, you're actually using a mouse but you're, they have the human cells within them or the human genome, part of the human genome within them. So you're able to um, really be working on a human and not really a mouse, though it's in a mouse. So it's called humanized. Um, and in doing that, you're able to get a lot of information from a small um, species and for fewer animals. So we look for reduction, refinement and replacement of animals when we can. Uh, to be able to fulfill the disease process and to be able to, to look for cures for unmet medical needs. Another area that we work in um, is infectious disease. And infectious disease, you're looking at bacteria, viruses, fungi, yeast, and other microorganisms. And as we know, we just came out of a pandemic with COVID, which was a virus. Some of these things pop up and we don't have uh, cures for them or treatments for them. And so again, we're looking to see how best can we find a way to either stop the disease process, slow it down. Um, and in doing that, again, consultation, it's discussions, is, is there an animal law that's av available? Is it an in vivo, pro in vitro process? Are there other methods that can be used to determine if this um, test product will work to either destroy, either to slow down the process um, and help with cure of the disease or stopping the disease process. So there are numerous different things that we use, that we look at when we're doing um, animal model development. Some of the other things that a laboratory animal veterinarian does is um, colony management. So we're looking at the colony of animals that we have, making sure they're healthy, looking to observe them on a regular basis to make sure that we know what normal is, because once we understand normal, then we can tell what abnormal is. We look at behavior to make sure that they are acting in a normal species specific behavior. Um, we look at their environment and try to enrich their environment to make sure that they're able to do the normal behavior that they would if they were um, not being used uh, for research, if they were, you know, giving them some manipulanda to use, giving them some foraging material, uh, looking at human interaction um, as things to sort of keep them in a, a well-suited state and, and, and ready um, for the projects that they may be put on. 
So I think you went over a little bit of my background. I um I went to Tuskegee University, which is a historically black college and university, and received a BS degree in biology. I then matriculated on to Tuskegee University uh, College of Veterinary Medicine, where I received my DVM in veterinary medicine. I then worked for a few years in clinical practice. Um, did some emergency medicine, and then went back to school to do a master's degree at Penn State University Hershey Medical Center in laboratory animal uh, medicine. And then it took my board some years later in laboratory animal medicine and became board certified in this field. I am really passionate about uh, education, um, STEM research in general and STEM careers in general, because I think it's important, especially for women um, and, and people of color to continue in this ever expanding field of many opportunities um, that you don't know, some which we don't even know yet because they're always, every day there's something new that opens up regarding STEM research, whether it be, you know, technology, um, whether it be engineering, math, uh, whether it be in the arts, you know, because some of it's STEAM sometimes also, that arts play a big role in this also. But there's a lot of opportunity for growth in biomedical research. Um, and I think that, you know, we should just be open to it, to take advantage of it and, and learn. And I just love science. I love the learning of it. It's an ever learning process where you continue to learn on a regular basis, whether it's a new disease area, whether it's a new therapeutic area, there's always something to learn and something to, to make you better and to enhance the lives of, of patients, be them animals or humans. I also spend time um, on a couple of boards, which also fuels me to be able to give back. Cause I think for who, who, who much is received, much is required. And so I do that by making sure I give back, whether it be mentoring people, whether it be um, stimulating growth in people, whether it be working in biomedical sciences to help people to understand the importance of them. Um, all of that to me is important. And then of course, you know, you, you have to do something for yourself <laughs> because if you're always giving to others and not replenishing yourself, then you're missing out on something and then you're not able to give yourself freely if you're not giving back to yourself as well as or as much as you give to others. Um, I think I've, uh, I've enjoyed my career. It's gone really fast. Um, I would say, you know, it's important to, to live in the present and to make sure that you're present for everything that you do, because life does pass you by so fast. And it seems to me that I just graduated from school just yesterday. <laughs> and here it's been quite a few years already. And then here down at the bottom, I have a picture of my pets. So just a couple of things to show you, my children and my pets. Uh, they're so cute. Um, thank you so much for discussing about your work and your career path with us. It seems really interesting. Um, so next, like, what is the most rewarding aspect of your career? So that's interesting. Um, you know, when you look at a career journey, it really is a journey. And there's ups and there's downs and there's all kinds of windy roads that that happen. And to me, some of the most you know interesting things are just dated. There's no typical day. Like every day is different, whether it be um, new programs coming on board, new projects, just new conversations with with individuals, or just actually management of people or management of um, facilities and facility processes. There's a lot that goes on in research every day that changes how your day is run. Um, so I think the learning for me and just the experiences that you gain, the people that you meet, the um, science that is being done, the, the goal of improving human lives through 
drug development. I mean, j just the goal itself is just thrilling to me and, and really just fuels me because you, we all want people to be healthy. Um, we all want people not to be in pain, people or animals to be in pain and anything we can do to alleviate that um, disease process, pain uh, is just, you know, phenomenal to me. And, and the process about going about to do it, the, the development of new entities, the being able to test new entities, the finding of new targets, you know, it's all just exciting in the way you have to attack it, the way the negative results as well as the positive results. You know, there, there's always something to be learned. Right. And that was super insightful and a very inspiring response. Um, next, so what can high school or pre-vet students do in order to prepare to become a vet? I think one of the things they can do is volunteer. Um, when you're in high school, volunteering is probably the easiest way to get a job <laughs> or to get some experience because nobody really turns away um, free labor, right? Or free interest, or if someone's interested in what you do, people don't turn that away. They like to talk to you. They like to show you what they do because they're excited about what they do. They want to share that um, and help someone develop and grow into who they're going to be. So um, in my own career, when I was in high school, I volunteered at the zoo. I was part of the Future Farmers of America because I went to our agricultural high school. Um, I went to 4-H fairs. There's ways to be involved with 4-H for farm animals. Um, there's also volunteering at shelters to help with the, the, the care of the animals there. And it also gives you that human bond interaction with animals also. So, you know, those are some of the things you can do because I know for vet school, you have to have volunteer hours, um, but I don't think they count until you're in college. But for you to start a relationship with a either a veterinary hospital or with a shelter. I mean, that's huge because once you have a relationship with a person or with a with an organization, they're more likely then to let you come back or to bring you on later in a paid position. So it's really a win-win situation where you learn a lot about maybe species you didn't learn about before and they get um, a, in a influx of new ideas, new thought process from a younger generation. So it really is just a win-win situation. Yeah, that's great advice. So for young people like me looking to go into veterinary medicine, what are some things to consider before going to vet school? Well, grades are important. They're not, you know, you don't have to have a 4.0, but you do have to have somewhat of good grades, just like any graduate school. They really want well-rounded people. So people that are not just bookworms or people that are not just, you know, just have practical experience. There has to be a balance. So make sure that you are well-balanced. Make sure that you have things that you like to do outside of the field of veterinary medicine, as well as things within the field of veterinary medicine. You don't wanna just be too narrow focused that everything you do is just centered around veterinary medicine, right? Um, you wanna make sure, you know, a lot of, uh, there's, there's some thought that you should do a major in something else and explore, I don't know, music or art, as long as you get your science requirements in and can, can apply. Because once you're in veterinary school, your sole focus is learning about all the different species, anatomy, physiology, pharmacology. And so you will be focused then. So maybe before, you know, add in a little fun humanities class um, as you're going through your college career, take some music lessons, have some other sort of outlet. So when during your veterinary school, when you have some downtime, you can do something else that you enjoy that clears your mind and gives you time to think freely. Yeah, those are super helpful points. Thank you for sharing that. And then lastly, what are some factors to consider when choosing which pre-vet or vet school to apply to? 
Oh, that's a hard one because I think that's a very personal choice because there are veterinary schools all over this country as well as in other countries too. So I really think it depends on, you know, um, where you have a support system perhaps, um, where you like the weather, <laughs> where um, you feel you have a good chance getting in. Um, I know when I went, there were some state requirements. Certain schools were specific for certain states. I'm not sure if that's still the case. And I hate to say I'm, I haven't kept up with that. Um, but, you know, that may be a factor too. Like if you live in Pennsylvania, possibly Penn is your best option because they take, you know, 90% of their students from Pennsylvania. So, you know, those types of things are important to know the information about the schools you're applying to and where do you have the best chance to get in. A lot of the requirements are the same, but just like anything, there are some differences um, within the application process as well as the application requirements. So just be sure that you look at all different schools um, and, and to where you're trying to get to, because that may depend too. Do you go to the Midwest where there may be a larger focus on farm animals if you want to be an exotic vet? I don't know. You know, you have to see what is their exotic program like? Are you interested in lab animal medicine? Are you interested in pathology? Are you interested in surgery? You know, are you interested in internal medicine? And which schools have the best um, match rate with institutions for those fields. So it's a lot to consider because you wanna put yourself into the best possible situation so that you get out of it what you want as well as the school gets out of it what they need from you. Right, those are definitely some very important um, aspects to consider. Well, um, thank you so much for chatting with me today and sharing your experience and insights as a veterinarian in the pharmaceutical industry. It's so inspiring to hear about your career journey, helping animals and making medicines for people. I wish you continued success in your career. Thank you. It was very nice to talk with you today and I wish everyone a thank you and good luck as you pursue your dream. Have a great rest of your afternoon.